This is the piece, Vitamin D Deficiency in COVID-19, Make D While the Sun Shines and When the Sun Doesn't Shine Supplement. So I, I began the piece right up front by saying that vitamin D deficiency is so widespread that many people are calling it a, uh, a pandemic, including many researchers, including even in the title of some papers. And some researchers are, are cautioning, you know, what we don't know if what we're looking at is um, is causation or just correlation. And so maybe there isn't really the problem that we think it is. And one of those big reviews is actually what we cited in our book, A Hunter Gatherer's Guide to the 21st Century. And so in the very, the very top um, paragraph, and actually, Zach, if you would please put this back on the screen and, and leave it up here while I'm talking about this, um, of this, of this piece, I say that although our, our larger point completely stands, that we have our, the hyper novel world that we have lived in, which is of course the main theme of our book, um, is part of what is, is making us likely vitamin D deficient. The fact that we have indoor lifestyles, the fact that we are told to slather ourselves with sunscreen whenever we go outside um, is a large part of what is making us vitamin D deficient. Um, but we uh, do not say don't supplement with vitamin D in the book, but we do say that we think it's yet another example of the sort of reductionist metric heavy thinking that so much of modern science and medicine is guilty of. And both of us have now on, on this point, at least on the, on the question of vitamin D supplementation, especially for those living far from the equator, have changed our tune. We have now seen enough research and have talked to enough people uh, that we think uh, that vitamin D deficiency uh, really is something that is difficult to escape from if uh, a few other things are true of you, about which I'll say a little bit more in a minute, but you have some things Yeah, I just wanted to point out what we did and didn't get right. Yeah. Um, our point in the book is that supplements do not appear to have a benefit if you don't have a deficiency and therefore an obsession with supplementing towards some ideal uh, state is unlikely to be effective. On the other hand, what I think has changed in our viewpoint is the likelihood that you are deficient in certain uh, nutrients. Well, I would say um, I would say there's an additional point, which is that supplements I, you know, isolate a particular thing. And, you know, when you take in, you know, for, so apparently something like 90% across our species of our vitamin D synthesis happens from exposure to the sun, specifically UVB rays. Um, but there are dietary sources and, uh, you know, largely fish, eggs, and organ meats like liver are the primary dietary sources. Um, but for vitamin D, like for, you know, everything else that we get through our diet, it, is not necessarily and often is guaranteed not to be as accessibly be as bioavailable to us if we just take it in some isolated form rather than with you know in combination with the food in which you would normally be getting it which is then providing also the other things that are necessary to you know whatever it is open up the pathways that allow it to to become part of you right totally agree with this and in fact in this case what we have um what you unearthed in your piece and what's evident in all of the vitamin D literature is that we have disrupted a very elegant system. And yeah. so, for example, this is a fat soluble vitamin. It deposits in fat. And so you can imagine an ancestor who during the plentiful times during the growing season is building up stores of vitamin D uh, in the sun. Mm -hmm. And then during lean times, as they are burning fat, it would be released. It's effectively a time release mechanism. Maybe. I actually took out that, that exact, probably yes, but there's more complications that I'm not yet prepared to go into here because there's, there's some questions about exact mechanism. Fair enough. In any case, the point is um, you have a prediction that comes from uh, the supplementation question, which yep. is, if this is about dealing with deficiency, then the point is, if you're not deficient, you don't need a supplement. If you are deficient, you do need a supplement, but it's not entirely clear how well that supplement works. Exactly. One of the issues with vitamin D is, can you take it up? Right. And so right. the fact that it is in your diet doesn't necessarily mean that it makes it into your physiology. And yep. so that's a that's a question. And probably it would be wise if we all got our vitamin D levels measured. So we at least even knew where we were. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and then there's, you know, there's also the issue, which maybe you'll get to. But the idea of we have stupid things like recommended daily allowance. Right. Recommended <laughs> daily allowance doesn't say 
summer, winter, it doesn't pay heed to the idea that this is actually a bankable vitamin, right? right? And that all of these things impinge on whether or not you should look at a vitamin D supplement and think that's something I might need or that's something I don't need. Yeah. Now, RDA is uh, a an overly simple metric the same way that the idea of a universally best diet for all humans is an overly simple metric. There, there can't actually be a number for any molecule that actually you can say that's the RDA for all humans across all ages, across both sexes, across all races and health and, and health qualities. Uh, there's no way, right? So we have one that is for some, you know, and it used to be <clears throat> I remember in the like in the '90s when we were in grad school, you would hear, ah, oh, you know, so many of the recommendations are just based on on men and specifically white men, and specifically white men of a certain age, and this this is a risk. And you know, we actually know this still for things like heart attack. Now we're not not talking about supplements here, but most of the signs, the warning signs of heart attack that people know of, are actually typical warning signs of heart attack for men, and typical signs of heart attack for women are different. And um, you know this this is this is a true thing, and yet somehow we still seek the simple universal rubric or metric that we can just carry around with us and exchange with other people as if what is right for us is inherently what is right for them. Um, I would just point out in passing that in some sense the best response to the woke claim that the only cause for disparities in outcome between populations is oppression, vitamin D is the ultimate proof that this isn't the case because yeah. you're headed this way. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so anyway, I'll just say this, the stem for the idea is we differ in amount of melanin based on where our ancestors lived. And that degree of protection from UV radiation, which is of course damaging, affects how readily you make vitamin D in the sun. So black people, for example, living in low latitudes have an obstacle to producing enough vitamin D that obviously isn't about oppression, right? You mean high latitudes? No, sorry. Yeah. Um, yes, so living at high latitudes. Yeah, let's just, let's just spell it out. And I do, I do exactly spell this out in the piece um, that, you know, dark skin color is exactly an adaptation uh, to tropical sun so that you don't burn. And the trade-off of not burning in the tropical sun due to dark skin coloration is that you synthesize vitamin D more slowly. And in our global world, in our global economy, when you have lots of people moving around compared to where our you know intermediate level ancestors lived, uh, pale skinned people, fair skinned people going to the equator are much more likely to burn. Um, but their vitamin D synthesis is going to be sky high. And dark skinned people moving far from the equator are not going to burn. They're, they're much less likely to burn anywhere, um, but they're much more likely to be vitamin D deficient. And so uh, one of the things that I started thinking about when I was writing this piece was all the comorbidities for COVID-19, many of which, maybe all of which we've talked about on this, on this show, on this podcast, um, are also conditions for which vitamin D deficiency um, are is is a known correlate. And so let me just walk through the, I think it was seven that I specifically pulled out. We have, and you can show, you, know, you are showing my screen. <laughs> Thank you, Zach. Um, so as I say, four of the most common conditions associated with vitamin D deficiency are also four of the most severe comorbidities for COVID-19, age, race, obesity, and kidney disease. So the older you are, the, the worse your outcome from COVID. This is one of the few things that everyone knows and everyone seems to agree on, even though it's still you have occasional social media tweets that ignore this fact. Um, but it's also true that the older you get, the less well you synthesize vitamin D and older people are more likely to be vitamin D deficient than young people. Point one. Point two, race, for exactly the reasons we were just talking about. We know that African Americans, we've been hearing that African Americans have poorer outcomes uh, than European Americans from, from COVID. And we've been, you know, we've been, some people have been trying to sell us on the fact that this is due to uh, inequities in medical care. And frankly, if you believe that it is entirely due to inequities in medical care at this moment in 2021, then you really should not be in charge of helping people because you are really not thinking things through clearly. It is true that because of the reasons that we just spelled out, the darker your skin, the less um, the less quickly you synthesize vitamin D and therefore the more you need to spend time in the sun or and 
and uh, potentially eating a diet rich in vitamin D rich foods. Although even those foods um, have a tiny percentage of the ability to uh, get vitamin D into you as vitamin as sun exposure does and or supplement. So I would just point and, out. And I do have the other five to get through. But okay. Yeah. I just point out, this isn't to say that oppression couldn't cause the problem. Right, you could have lousy health care in it, it, certain parts I, it of town. It could not be the only cause, is my point. Right, but the point is because both of these things point in the same direction. Yes. Right. Um, so an economic disparity sure. and a melanin skin, uh, a sunscreen, a built-in sunscreen that blocks the production of vitamin D mm -hmm. would both point in the same direction. This is what people your and my age would call a confound. What people below forty-five seem to now call a confounder. Um, but in any case, this is just something I've noticed. I'm going to stick with confounder. Yeah, I think me, me too. Although I'm not entirely convinced confounder isn't uh, grammatically more correct. But mm -hmm. but in any case, I'm going to be stodgy and they can just get the hell off my lawn. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> Too bad for them. We don't have a lawn. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I care about no it No Cheerios, less. no lawn. Yeah. What the hell are we doing? We even call ourselves Americans. Right. Uh, How's that? Yeah. But anyway, so so the point is what you what you what you've got is a situation in which you don't know what the contribute what the contribution of uh, melanin versus uh, disparities in healthcare is, but at the very least, it is insane to imagine that the only cause would be oppression. That to find an outcome right. uh, difference inherently points to oppression is, right. is nonsense. And you know how many people of any skin color know that skin color actually affects the ability to synthesize vitamin D in your skin and that vitamin D is a well-known uh, correlate of so many health outcomes. I'm not going to go into it here because we have a lot of other things we want to do today, but you know, go read this piece. It's available for free on my Substack. The number of health conditions that are associated with vitamin D deficiency is extraordinary from cancers to, uh, to uh, immune response, to infectious diseases, including influenza, to other upper respiratory viruses. It is truly extraordinary. So, um, let me just get through these top you got something quick? Well, I got one more thing, okay. which is also notice that our public health authorities do not say politically incorrect things like, hey, take a look at your skin. And, you know, depending upon how dark it is, you, we have a very different recommendation based on, you know, based on that, how much lying in the sun you'll probably ought to do, right? Like right. How, how often do they recommend lying in the sun to anybody? Right. But in fact, it's probably a good idea. Anyway, I would point out there is an app, which I have just become aware of called DMinder. Yeah. which actually takes all sorts of factors. And uh, it would be great if you knew your D levels to start with, which it has a, a field for. But anyway, it tells you what hours of the day you're capable of making vitamin D. Given where you are on the given planet. Given where you are on the mm -hmm. planet. Right. It includes all these things, yeah. including skin color. Yeah. Great. Um, yeah. Did we start? I, I, so I, I'm, I'm not going to go through the whole piece here, but I, you know, I didn't say... I guess we did say the farther from the equator you are, the less capable of synthesizing D. Um, the closer to the winter solstice uh, it is, um, the harder it is to synthesize D. And add to that these things which are um, internal to who you are as opposed to, to the environment that you're in. Age, race, obesity. The higher your BMI, uh, the less good at synthesizing vitamin D from the sun you are and the more likely you are to be deficient. And of course, we know that's one of the major comorbidities for COVID. And then chronic kidney disease <clears throat> is both a major comorbidity for COVID and a um, at least a correlate of vitamin D deficiency. And then uh, these additional three things, and it's really it's really five depending on how you count. I was less certain of the connection, although um, I've since, even since just posting this on Tuesday, um, have since learned more and I, I'm growing more certain. Um, both depression and anxiety disorders, uh, both of which are actually considered comorbidities for COVID-19 in this piece, uh, in this massive article that we've talked about in past episodes um, have been linked to vitamin D deficiency. So that's, again, both anxiety disorders and depression. Diabetes, both type 1 and type 2, um, is uh, are, are understood to be downstream of vitamin D deficiency. Not entirely, you know, not, it's not the only factor, but uh, vitamin D deficiency is definitely a cause in developing these things and are both COVID comorbidities. And then being institutionalized, like in a nursing home or a care home, is associated with vitamin D deficiency simply because you're 
very often not even allowed outside. And of course, we know that nursing homes were um, basically super spreader places. And you know what's true of nursing homes? At the very least, it's institutionalized old people, which um, brings two of these risk factors right up close. So uh, you know, is there, you know, can we say that vitamin D deficiency is causal in bad COVID outcomes? Uh, some people are saying that. I am, uh, I am still thinking on it, but are there a ton of correlations between the two conditions? And do you actually have control? You, everyone listening, um, if you have access to, you know, a, a drugstore to start supplementing with vitamin D if you're deficient? Yes, you do. So, um, you know, to the degree that you can take control of your own health, do so. Um, I would just finally point out that there is some question about the causal nature of sufficient D levels in resistance of COVID, but yeah. it is A, probable that D is causally protective, that sufficient levels of D are protective. But the key thing, uh, and this is an argument that has been made by several people, we made it, um, others, uh, some of whom we know have also made it for various other substances, but there is a Pascal's wager issue at the very bottom of this. Yes. Which okay. is to say that the risk, the, the likelihood that you are D deficient is incredibly high. The number of things that D seems to be protective of is incredibly large. The harm to you if you raise your D levels and it somehow turned out that D was a third correlate and not causal is so low. The cost of this stuff is very cheap. The danger of taking way too much of it is very low mm -hmm. and um, the potential benefit is sky high. And so the point is you might as well. But then the real import of that is to the extent that our public health authorities are not recommending this, have not been recommending it throughout the pandemic, you know that they are either incompetent at a level that strains credulity or not interested in health. And until they change their tune on this, I think one has to look at everything they say with a kind of skepticism. How do I know this person is actually interested in my health the way they claim to be if they are not picking the lowest hanging fruit on the tree, which is vitamin D? Um, and, you know, that's a jaw dropping thing to say. Public health officials who aren't interested in, in health, public or otherwise, uh, that's a remarkable claim. On the other hand, how else are we to explain their total silence on vitamin D?